Welcome, and welcome back to the OK Grognard Show. It is Thursday, May 20th, 2021, 10 a.m. more or less central, in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. We're going to continue with our Spell Explanations series. I think we're on third level of Druids. Yeah. Talking about the DMG... Dungeon Master's Guide, additional spell explanations for spells they felt were unclear that they had published a year earlier in the Player's Handbook for First Edition, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And a couple minutes late this morning. Sorry to say, it's all right. We'll work it out. Had some pressing things happen around here. I had to clear up before I could free myself to do the show, but I didn't want to not do the show and cancel it, so had to be a little bit late. And here we go. What are we looking at first here? I think we're looking at... Yeah, third level spells. Call Lightning being... the first of those that they felt needed some explanation. We'll dive right in. Call lightning. If a djinn or an air elemental is on hand to form a whirlwind, the druid is able to summon half-strength lightning strokes therefrom. Half-strength lightning strokes. So, <clears throat> my reading of this is that if the druid can be in league with one of these two types of creatures, they can assist in adjusting the spell and make half-strength lightning strokes rather than full strength. I don't think this is to say And I guess it is to say, you know, it may well be that if either of these creatures is on hand to form a whirlwind, whether the druid likes it or not, that the lightning strokes, but it says is able, not can only. I'm going to go with my first interpretation on that. This has never come up in a game for me before, so it's something I'm really reading and interpreting this explanation right now then more than a few of these are snare is the next spell on the list the material of the noose can be cut with any magic blade or a non-magical sharp instrument with a two hit bonus of plus two or better so there's a question are there a lot of Non-magical plus two weapons? Maybe in your campaign. Maybe that was something Gary did more often than he would have professed in the rules. So that's something worth exploring, too. And, you know, <clears throat> a non-magical sharp instrument could be Maybe the blade from a blade barrier. Those get pluses to hit if something is stationary. I don't know if that's the way you want to uh, get out of a snare by casting a blade barrier on yourself, but maybe summon insects. If thick smoke or hot flames are near the target creatures, Morning, George. The insects called forth will not go near the intended victim. Those who might are considered dazed and burnt to a crisp. The spell... Uh, I would say that's dazed if in thick smoke and burnt to a crisp if hot flames. The spell thus fails. <clears throat> Likewise... 
If the victim steps into such an area, all insects are gone that instant, so that the next round it may act normally. So you might have a demon that can call forth flames and just eradicate any insects summons that were uh, plaguing it. George was talking about uh, something being situational. He was talking about that call lightning. It does seem very specific. Often when I read these spell explanations, they seem reactionary to something that probably transpired in a game he was running or a game he saw being run, because I know he observed some games being run by others. He played a bit. Not a ton, but when he did, I'm sure he saw some other things or some things came up in his mind as ways to exploit a uh, semantic loophole in something. And then uh, he thereafter made a note for the DMG spell explanations on a way to close it. And of course, you know, up on a soapbox had... Uh, any number of additional discussions about specifics, in-game specifics for DMs that likely also stem from things that happened in his own games. And, uh, oh, thank you, George. He, George uh, concurs. And they do. I just read that way, kind of reactionary. And that, not that it's reactionary in a bad way. It just, should we say reactive? I don't know. Maybe that's a better, less, less uh, charged adjective. Tree. Note that the druid can appear as a conifer, bush, etc. The armor class of such a plant is that of the druid. And its hit points are likewise those of the druid. So you can be more than just a tree. I think that I will never see a druid posing as a tree. But there you have it. Fourth level spells. Animal summoning one. More probable animals in the area. Four probable animals in the area. See the foregoing commentary on locate animals. The animals typically summonable are apes, badgers, baboons, black bears, giant badgers, beavers, giant. Hmm. And then there's a whole more list here. Most of them wild creatures. Boars, wild, warthogs, bulls, camels, cattle, wild cattle, that is. Crocodiles, <clears throat> dogs, wild, giant eagles, giant goats, herd animals, summonable only by specific animal type. Wild horses, hyenas, jackals, jaguars. Leopards, giant lizards, giant lynx, giant owls. That's a good one. Giant rams, giant rats, poisonous snakes, spitting snakes, giant weasels, wolves, dire wolves, wolverines. So well, some of these might seem on their face to be better than others. Any move penalty as a tree. I'm going to go with stationary. Unless maybe you're a creeping vine. <laughs> I'm going to say no move at all. Yeah, I agree. With these animals, um, wolves, dire wolves, I might think, why wouldn't I just go with dire wolves if I have the option between the two? Well, there may be a situation where a smaller animal is more useful in a specific case. A uh, dire wolf might be too big for the action at hand that is expected of them once they're summoned. You will note that animals with 4 plus N, 1, 2, 3, hit dice, 
are included. If the druid names such an animal type, allow summoning if otherwise indicated, but limit the number appearing to one to three. Call woodland being. These sorts of creatures <clears throat> are the type which should be should generally be indicated on area maps as to location and numbers. However, if by chance you are forced faced with the problem of a druid casting this spell where such information is not at hand, use the following random percentages percentage possibilities. Creature type called, we're talking brownies, centaurs, dryads, pixies, satyrs, sprites, treants, and unicorns. And number appearing is right there. Light, moderate, dense are the types of woodland they expect. Moderate also being sylvan and dense being virgin forest or woodlands. So, you know, far from civilization. And the percentages are there, 30, 20, and 10 for the brownies. So on and so forth. They fluctuate. There's no... There's no curve here to follow. There's no specific thing to memorize. I think the idea that, mostly speaking, creatures tend to be, creatures of the various types tend to be either from light, moderate, or dense woodlands, but mostly can be found in others. Light woodlands do not support treants or unicorns. Other than that, these creatures can be found just about anywhere. It says also, <clears throat> add 1% per level of the druid casting the spell, except where 0%. Hey, Henry Armit, it's good to see you there. Check in order for each type by rolling percentile dice, and if at hand... Or, and if at the end of the list nothing is indicated, there are no woodland beings within spell range. For example, a 10th level druid begins the spell in a sylvan wood. There's a 30% chance for brownies, but the dice roll shows 35, so none come. Then a 40% chance for centaurs gets a dice score of 72. But finally, a 35% uh, chance for dryads gets a dice roll of 10, so 1 to 4 dryads will come. Since the call was successful, no further checks are made. So yeah, that's a lot easier to deal with. Um, and again, this is a randomizer in the case where it is an area that you had not already developed. If you've already developed a certain woodland as the land of the centaurs, then those are the ones you would check to see if they could be uh, called when you call woodland being. So you want to look for that. Now that's not to say that you can't check them first, and then if they are not around, not go down the list and check the others. But you want to favor those if it's a uh, if it's a planned area of your map, and you wish to. Uh, favor that particular creature in that area. Dispel magic. See the comments on the cleric spell of the same name for the effects of this spell upon an item. Okay. That's a couple of videos ago. Hallucinatory forest. Touching the illusory growth will neither inform the individual as to its nature, will, nor will it affect the magic. So, touching this... Uh, doesn't inform you that it's hallucinatory so that would seem to indicate that it's not just a visual illusion hmm that's an interesting one I think we're going to deal a lot with that during uh, illusion uh, spell explanations and there might be some enlightenment there that's a little vague, though. That seems to suggest that you would be touching something, or think you are, if you are enthralled by this illusion. On the other hand, 
one wonders how a visual illusion would manifest as a physical one and how you are actually touching it if it is only a visual illusion to begin with. So I always found some of this stuff a little confusing or perhaps mm, counterintuitive. But let's move on and we'll deal with that when we get to illusion spells. Fifth level spells, transmute rock to mud. Rate of sinking is one foot per segment, i.e. one foot per six seconds or 10 feet per minute in a round. Brush thrown upon the surface will stop sinking of creatures able to climb atop it. Use discretion as to the amount of brush and the weight of creatures. Ropes can be used to pull creatures out of the mire, assuming that sufficient power is available. One man to one man, ten men for a horse, vice versa. So... All is not lost if you are standing on a dungeon floor and a evil wizard turns it to mud under your feet and you begin to sink. It's not an immediate drop like it would be into a pond. I guess it is meant to uh, emulate in a way quicksand of a sort. So there you go. Wall of Fire. It is not possible. For the spellcaster to move at all and maintain concentration on the wall of fire. Now that's an interesting little tidbit there. Because it would be fairly easy to suggest that unless a specific spell says otherwise. That a spellcaster can't move when maintaining concentration on a spell. There are a few spells that suggest the caster continue, can continue to move at like a slow pace. So maybe those should be the exception to the rule of needing to maintain, to not move when maintaining concentration. Worth thinking about for your own campaigns. Six level spells. Anti-animal shell. The shell is non-mobile. Humans even though able to use magic, are non-magical, as are dwarves, elves, etc. Conjure fire elemental. Holy unholy word will send any elemental back to its plane. Okay, so there's a way to uh, combat conjure fire elemental, and I suppose any elemental conjured this way whether it's fire, water, air, or earth, should all be uh, sent back to their plane by those two potential spells. And I think they only mention holy unholy because, obviously, evil clerics use unholy word, and if you conjure an elemental against them, then they should be able to combat it with that as well. Fire seeds, as with missiles of the type produced by a produce flame spell, all fire seed missiles are considered to be short range and misses are handled as described in grenade-like missiles subsection of combat, which you should also have on the first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master screen, so utilize that too for further explanation of the rules. Turn wood. Even magical weapons with wooden sections can be turned. An anti magic shell will protect from the spell, and dispel magic will have normal chances of wiping out its effects. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Wall of Thorns, dexterity bonus to armor class is not considered in this case. If a wall of fire results from the burning of the thorns, the side toward the, towards the druid will be the non-harmful one. 
worth noting. So you can turn a wall of thorns into a wall of fire and it still offers the same types of protection to the caster even if someone else ignites the wall of thorns the side with the druid on it is still protected seventh level spells chariot of sastare sastare i'm not even sure this vehicle and its steeds are from the elemental plane of fire therefore they are subject to forced return to this plane such as by dispel magic holy unholy word etc conjure earth elemental as noted regarding fire elemental holy unholy word will send it back to its own plane firestorm the reverse fire quench will cause a flame tongue flaming sword to be extinguished unless it makes a successful saving throw versus crushing blow once extinguished the weapon becomes non-magical so there's a spell that literally destroys a magic item not a lot of those around often dispel magic suppresses magical effects on items for a period of time so that's pretty nasty although it is a seventh level druid spell so there you go reincarnation this one gets a lot of interesting banter regardless of the form of the creature in which the character is reincarnated allow the new form to progress as far as possible in the characteristics in characteristics and abilities for example a badger character could grow to giant size have maximum hit points plus bonus points for a high constitution and the high intelligence level of its former character a centaur reincarnation might eventually gain hit dice up to five six seven or even eight and it would be eligible to wear armor and use magic items i don't see it here but if a human is turned into an elf and it doesn't lose any of its knowledge so let's say it was a fighter or let's say it was yeah let's say it was a cleric then I would suggest that this is saying you can continue to go up in level as an elf cleric uh, but only to the maximum the cap set for elf clerics and I believe that's just for NPCs nature loves a druid it seems <laughs> well said Sarah George says not sure why if I ever ran a druid over the last 40 years might be time yeah druids are crazy powerful they can be a blast to play they have a lot of uh, good spells obviously uh, armor can be a little less than a regular cleric they still have uh, scimitars and other weapons that can do a fair amount of damage they progress to hit chart uh, as on the two hit chart as a cleric so not too bad there and uh, some of their spells are phenomenal i suggest if you look up their spells as you're deciding look for ones that don't allow saving throws I think you'll find that pretty interesting. Entangle? I rolled up some druids, but never played one, says Henry Armitage. And many of us have probably rolled up a number of uh, practice characters or characters to have ready to play that maybe a game didn't happen or we were just curious about the process and we're rolling up random characters to try them out George says he's into it absolutely always work your way up from low levels with new classes well we're on to magic user spells but I tell you what we're uh, running low on time boy this might be one of the lar longest uh, series it's one of the longest sections uh, specific sections of the 
Dungeon Master's Guide, so no doubt it makes sense. Um, we've done four parts as of today. I had planned on at least five. And uh, since we're just getting into the magic user spells, and I think I have three and a half pages of this left, maybe almost four out of nine, I think we can expect another three f or four. And we'll see how deep in the woods we get, especially with uh, dealing with illusions. So that may cause us to... Uh, to uh, take quite a bit of time examining some of those spell explanations. And, you know, there are a lot of magic user spells, and the fact that there are so many pages left would suggest that uh, as we get to the higher level spells, we'll definitely have our hands full with some of the explanations. So we'll see how that goes. In any event, I do want to say... Thank you to everybody. Yeah, this is a fun series, Sarah. I, I appreciate the fact that you're enjoying it. The, um, you know, anytime, anytime uh, you can add more nuance to a game, whether it's within the rules itself or at the table, I think it becomes a more interesting, uh, a more interesting endeavor for playing and for running. So these uh, various rules explanations help out a lot for those who've had questions. Doesn't answer all questions. There will always be more. These questions were answered, were asked and answered by the people that wrote the game, not just Gary, but I'm sure others at his table, whether that's Ernie or Jim Ward, Tim Cask, any of the any of the uh, early faithful who were playing at these tables and uh, it's got to be very true that they didn't stop having questions as soon as the DMG came out and I think that's why up on the soapbox the regular column for Dragon Magazine was also utilized for uh, explanations, clarifications, as well as new ideas that he had. I mean, you know, Gary never stopped having more and more ideas. Thanks to everybody who uh, popped into the chat today. Thanks to everybody who's checking this out on YouTube. If you do come by, on Monday or Thursday at 10 a.m. Central for a live stream of the show. Please do speak up in the chat and by all means follow the channel. Please do that too. He knocked Pratt's there today too. Then we got a whole crowd. This is great. And feel free to ask questions when the stream is underway and uh, we'll uh, definitely address them as we can on on the stream right away but if you're catching up with this on youtube by all means subscribe to the channel and click the little bell so that you get notifications when new videos are uploaded we do the show monday and tuesday at 10 a.m and then we upload it almost immediately so usually within an hour at least within the day if there's some uploading problems you should see the video there on the youtube archive so do subscribe there and also give us a thumbs up for any videos you watch and enjoy and do us a favor and drop any comments, you know, constructive criticism, uh, comments on what's going on. We appreciate anything you do to help make the show better. I want to say thanks to everybody once again. This has been the OK Grognard Show from beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Bye bye.